Our opening words this morning are from Erica Hewitt. Let us remember and celebrate this morning that each of our bodies was woven together in the depths of mystery, cells multiplying, tissues taking form, organs taking up their function, all under the silky cover of skin. Let us gather in reverence for the gift of these bodies, whatever their ages, their shapes, their abilities. And may we know them to be channels of the world coming alive through us. These bodies, these blessings, bring the world to life through seeing, taste, hearing, scent, and touch. May we bring to our intricately woven bodies a sense of sacred caretaking. In doing so, let us also be grateful for the embrace of the holy, the presence that creates and sustains life, the mystery that knit together each of our bodies, and the force of love that celebrates our desires. Well, let me start by confessing that I am a fan of Western medicine. When I'm really sick, I head to the doctor. The first thing I did when I came to Edmonton was find a family doctor, and I have seen him annually, or more, ever since. Now, I'm lucky. He doesn't do medicine by the numbers. He listens. When something's going on, I want his opinion first. Call it an act of faith or blind obedience in better living through chemistry, but that's where I feel comfortable. Now, while I may start with my doc, I don't always stop there. I do consider holistic methods. I take pharmaceutical grade vitamins. When I started them, I noticed, observed distinct changes that I could track. For one thing, I no longer need reading glasses. That came as an interesting surprise. I've used chiropractors, massage therapists, and even acupuncture once to good effect. My children were both born at home with the help of a midwife before that practice became integrated into our healthcare system. Alternative medicine, I think, has its place. But still, my vaccines are up to date and I get an annual flu shot. Now, I know that some people have doubts about the value of Western medicine. I respect that. It can only do so much. I don't need to win a debate with anybody on this. But what tips the balance for me is the scientific method. I want tested treatments based on provable, repeatable, and statistically justifiable evidence. And that can be a problem with some alternative therapies. Some of them seem to offer more noise than actual evidence about their efficacy. I googled my sermon title, Healing the Body, this week. You never know what you're going to find when you google your sermon title. It's always fun. Now, most of the first 40 or 50 links were references to the four, five, six, seven, or nine foods that will heal your body. There were several articles about meditation and health, and several sites that advocate the power of prayer, including 40 Bible verses about healing. Yeah. Now, what concerned me most was that few of those claims were peer-reviewed or discussed the results according to a traditional scientific method. They may have been perfectly good ideas, but it's hard to have confidence in a claim that is supported only by testimonials of people I do not know. Our Unitarian Universalist principles and sources invite us to heed the guidance of reason and the results of science and warn us against the idolatries of mind and spirit. I've always liked that phrase, the idolatries of mind and spirit. Sometimes, when we want to believe something badly enough, we give it a level of truth it perhaps does not deserve. A startling number of Americans, for example, believe that their president is being tarred by false news. The only evidence offered is his word that it's not true. Not exactly the kind of proof likely to make the cover of Scientific American. The actor Steve McQueen 
back in the 70s was desperately fighting cancer at the end of his life. And when medical science could do no more, he very publicly went to Mexico for Laetrile treatments, a drug made from apricot pits and bitter almonds. He died, of course. There are still no clinical trials supporting Laetrile, yet people still do buy it on the black market. Now, I cannot fault a desperate person turning to desperate measures, but the fact that 50 years later no maker of the drug has proven its utility suggests that the makers are trading on desperation and belief. I found one online cancer treatment company, Oasis of Hope. Lovely pictures of doctors looking at MRIs or something like that. And it proudly lists itself with the label of accredited business. <laughs> it boasts survival rates 50% higher than the US average. That's their only statistic. No backup, no independent verification. I know a number of cancer researchers these days because I ride with them. And you know, I'm pretty sure that these dedicated people would have noticed a success rate like that if it were true. Desperation can lead easily to idolatry because desperate people need to believe. And they throw away their money and they throw away their hearts because they are desperately, desperately in need of help that no one can give. Now, I don't think many of us would take the 40 Bible verses of healing as our sole medical guide. So why then place complete faith in unverified claims and miracle cures? They simply promise what people most need to hear. Now, this is not a trashing of holistic medicine or alternative therapies, as you will see. Some of them have been tested and they do work. Vitamin therapy has been around for a long time. Some over-the-counter products have a proven track record of at least helping address symptoms. And such medications have a definite place in our world. And of course, medical science does not have all of the answers. There are diseases like multiple sclerosis and fibromyalgia that continue to mystify. And the doctors are quite open about that. Years ago, I sat on a local board in Vancouver for fibromyalgia sufferers back when only a very few doctors even recognized the existence of this condition. These folks teamed up together to dig through literature and prove their case to doctors and possibly even more importantly to the insurance companies that handled their disability claims. And today, fibromyalgia is recognized far more widely as real although its cause and cure continues to baffle the medical establishment. No, medicine doesn't have all the solutions, not at all. In fact, medicine finally seems to be moving away from the old, we're the experts and you're not model. Those who attended our first living and dying seminar a couple of weeks ago heard a video where an intensive care unit doctor was happily admitting that they do not save lives that that's a misnomer, that they only prolong them, that doctors are not magicians, that they can't solve all problems. Medicine can only help prolong life for a while and hopefully help preserve quality of life. And I find this medical humility somewhat refreshing, and it has led to a bridging between traditional medicine and other healing hearts, arts in the field of integrative medicine. That's defined as uh, integrative medicine pairs traditional medicine with other treatments to care for your mind, body, and spirit. For example, your doctor may suggest chemotherapy to fight your cancer, as well as acupuncture to help manage the effects. It isn't just medicine. Your care team may design a plan to help you build healthy behaviors and skills, like smart eating habits and stress-busting activities. These things can keep you healthy for the long term. Integrative medicine uses complementary treatments, but they have to be backed by good science. Always tell your doctor before you try a non-traditional treatment, and that way you'll know if it's safe and if it's likely to work. 
Several years ago, my doctor told me that I had crossed the line into type 2 diabetes. Before sending me to the pharmacist for drugs, however, he sent me to the dietician, who helped me evaluate my lifestyle choices. And she debunked myths. Apparently, I can still have ice cream now and then. And coached me on things like portion control and encouraged me gently to begin an exercise plan that's now led to long-distance cycling. I am still, my sugars are still only just above the line into type 2 diabetes. The most important message that the team gave me was that I, not the doctor, was really the one in my charge of my health going forward. If I didn't want to suffer the effects of the disease as my father had in old age, I had to take control of my life. And that brings us back to our principles and sources. After all, it's a document that reminds us that faith and religions are things in our hands. No one here dictates beliefs to you. There may be people around here who can help you with your spiritual health, but there isn't just one person that you have to listen to. You have to weigh the words of many voices and then make your own decisions. We need to have the same view of health care. And that means doing more than walking in and saying, I'm sick, I want a prescription, give me drugs. Certainly, listen to science. But don't be passive. Take a hand in shaping your own health. The basics remain the same as they have always been. Eat well, indulge your vices in moderation, get good sleep, and exercise regularly. And then there's attitude. Among those 50 or so Google articles that I looked at, I found one by an award-winning science journalist, someone who has science to back her up. One. Her name is Jo Marchant. I de it detailed the role of the mind as a healer as described in scientific literature. She writes, let's be clear. Claims that the mind can heal aren't harmless. When made in the absence of evidence, they raise false hope, and if people reject conventional treatment they need, they can die. That includes cancer patients, but less dramatic cases risk lives too. Some homeopaths regularly caution parents not to vaccinate their children against potentially fatal childhood infections, for example and also advise travelers against conventional drugs to protect against malaria. Perhaps it's not surprising, then, that skeptics react to any suggestion of healing thoughts as an evil threat to be stamped out, branding everything from placebo research to integrative medicine as quackery. But when researching my book, Cure, A Journey into the Science of the Mind Over Body, I came to the conclusion that this position isn't supported by science either. Although the mind isn't a miracle cure, we will always need physical drugs and treatments, there is now overwhelming evidence that it drives biological changes that are crucial for physical health, influencing everything from pain to our immune system. <clears throat> our mental state has particularly dramatic effects when it comes to symptoms we experience, things like pain, nausea, fatigue, and depression. Playing a virtual reality game eases pain in burn patients by as much as 50% more than drugs alone. While research on placebos, fake treatments, tells us that psychological factors such as expectation and social interaction ease symptoms via biological changes very similar to those caused by the drugs. Placebo painkillers trigger the release of natural pain relief pain-relieving chemicals called endorphins. Parkinson's patients, for example, respond to placebos with a flood of needed dopamine. It might sound crazy that thoughts and expectations should have similar effects to drugs, but underlying many placebo responses is the simple principle that the symptoms we feel aren't a direct, inevitable consequence of physical damage to the body. Such damage is important, of course, but ultimately, our experience of it is controlled by our brain. Interesting article. 
Face it, we will all be affected by illness, and we will all die in our time. I will never not be a diabetic. Others will live with other conditions, some of which will be disheartening and depressing. The challenge we each face is how we're going to live with it, and that's the mental part of the game. Along the way, there is a lot we can do. At a multiple sclerosis dinner a few nights ago, Laura and I listened to a woman in her 30s describing how she refused to be changed by her illness. Now, this didn't mean that she denied it or she didn't have to deal with it on a daily basis. She was very upfront about that. She just meant that she had decided that she was going to remain the same person she always had been and would not be defined by MS. That's taking charge of your health and using your mind and your spirit as part of your treatment plan. May it be so for all of us. Amen. And now just uh, because we're focusing on the body today, uh, our meditation is going to be a little bit different. I'm going to lead you through a bit of a guided meditation. So please make yourselves comfortable and get in the lights. So relax into your chair and begin to quietly focus on your breathing. Not trying to change it in any way. Just noticing if it's deep or shallow, fast or slow. Allowing yourself to be present with your breath. And as you begin to relax, notice how your breathing becomes slower, deeper, more even. How your muscles also begin to relax. Allow yourself to let go of any tension you are holding. Let your shoulders drop, your jaw unclench. Let go of all you are holding on to. Now we'll begin to focus in on our heart center. They say home is where the heart is. How's your heart? Does it feel empty, heavy, overfull? Let's breathe into that heart space together and allow that energy to move in whatever way it needs to. Imagine you are breathing directly in and out from your heart center. Let that energy expand outwards from your body. the rest of the room, feeling all the other hearts and souls present with you here today, outwards from this building to the rest of the city, the rest of the country, the rest of our planet and all the other souls that share it with you. Breathe with them. Share that movement of energy with them.
They say home is where the heart is. How's your heart? Keep breathing, slow and deep and even. Keep allowing. And now, bring yourself to your quiet center to that place of stillness where you can be the observer to the goings-on in this body you are currently wearing. Simply watching without the need to be or do anything. Resting completely in the present moment. 